What's up guys, Slacky, no shield, no chill.com. And today we're going to be talking about some interesting photos that someone sent me of uh, Michael Chandler and running down what I think his stack is. Only joking, it's the Jack Slack podcast. I'm your boy, Jack Slack. And we're coming at you on Monday, the 17th of May, talking about UFC 262, colon, how was this a pay per view? Um, but the main event was banging, and the, the fights that I said could be banging, which was one, was banging, and then there were a couple of other interesting fights, so we'll talk about that. Um, I watched far too many of those More Plates, More Dates uh, videos, and about a half minute into each, I realised, actually, I'm not interested in this at all. Why is it being pushed to me? Oh, because I keep clicking on them. But anyway, it was UFC 262 at the weekend. It was Michael Chandler versus Charles Oliveira. Uh, Oliveira. Um, and it was the decider for the lightweight title because that's the situation we're in now. We talked about this sort of extensively last week. Um, you know, you got Poirier and Gaethje are guys who we would consider also maybe top lightweight at the moment following the um, retirement of Habib Nurmagomedov. But otherwise, um, you know, Oliveira on an amazing streak. Chandler, long-time Bellator champion and then not champion. You know, he lost the he lost the belt as many times as he won it. Actually, maybe more because he lost a vacant belt, uh, a belt for a vacant belt once. But, you know, he was around in Bellator forever being their champion. Came over, knocked out Dan Hooker in impressive fashion. Um, and the UFC clearly wanted him to win this. <laughs> like, all the embedded stuff this week was like Michael Chandler's blog. Um, and he almost did. So let's talk about that fight very, very interesting, because we talked about last week a number of ways that they match up and how both men benefit so much from getting on the front foot, specifically in this matchup too. You know, they're both front foot fighters, but they're also both fighters who tend to fall apart when they're pushed onto the back foot. Um, so I said, you know, watch for this one, because if they both do what I think they're going to do, it'll be a car crash. And wouldn't you know, it was a car crash. <laughs> um, both come out aggressive. Uh, Oliveira, very, very much the taller man. Uh, but very spindly always. But, you know, he looked absolutely massive. He was saying after this fight, I'm not writing out going, you know, I'm not writing off going down to featherweight. They give me a, ch uh, a title shot. And you're like, I don't believe you could come close to making that weight anymore. Um, but they come out and uh, Oliveira was looking for uh, push kicks to the, to the stomach, front kicks to the uh, solar plexus. He was looking for the check hook, which has always been well, recently certainly has been a, a massive weapon for him. He's used it since like the Lentz fights to pull his guy into a collar tie and then start elbowing and kneeing. And he was looking for the calf kick, which has always been an issue for Chandler because he stands so long um, and so uh, narrow too. So, it, it, you know, his stance front to back is very long, but side to side is very short, which you saw with those calf kicks knocking him off balance immediately. Now, the intrigue of this was, like, Chandler's best weapons are obviously his big punches, but his um, his right straight to the body has been a huge part of that. Oliveira's uh, check hook is a huge part of his game. There's a matchup there where, you know, it's interesting because uh, I'll, I'll jump back on that in a minute. But from the get go, Oliveira's trying to check hook him and pull him in. And I thought it was very dangerous to start doing that right from the get go. But that's how Oliveira has been fighting lately. He's been... His defense has been improved by going balls to the wall early and just trying to get the guy out of there. Um, but, you know, reaching f uh, and uh, for the back of the head and trying to pull Chandler in right from moment one seemed like quite a dangerous decision because Chandler is so very quick and explosive. But right from the start, he lands a couple of those check hooks as Chandler's coming in for a right straight to the body. Chandler comes in again and cracks him with, I think it was a left hook in the aftermath of that and wobbled him. Oliveira shoots for a takedown, Chandler jumps for a guillotine, influence of Neil Melanson there, I think, the arm in guillotine, uh, jumps for it, doesn't uh, secure it, and in the course of trying to like sweep Oliveira over, uh, Oliveira pops his head out and starts guard passing, gets on Chandler's back, locks the full figure four as Chandler stands up and then jumps back on his own back to slam him. Um, but then Chandler did an amazing job of, of just fighting the hands. You know, that's the uh, biggest part of wrestling from the bottom is fighting the hands. And that's the bit where people just sort of give up in like a traditional MMA or jiu-jitsu match. Once a guy's on your back, you're like, uh-oh, you know, claw at his hands for a bit, but then eventually get choked out. But he just kept a hold of that hand, eventually whizzed it over his head like um, Anthony Pettis did a dozen times against Oliveira and turned back into his guard. Oliveira's guard, always money. Um, Chandler stood over him for a minute and you saw him use uh, threat of the up kicks always, and certainly against a, a short opponent like uh, Chandler, that's a great idea. But that deep De La Hiva, which we talked about in the Filthy Casuals guide, uh, got the De La Hiva all the way to the other, uh, to, you know, round the lead leg and hooked into the opponent's far hip and turned him away and tried to sit up on a single. 
Ended up getting pushed back to his back though. And then he got clubbed with a, I think it was a right hand near the end of the round. Oh no, it was a, it was a right hand that he jumped in with like a, an extra le- leaping left hook afterwards and caught, uh, caught Oliveira along the fence and wobbled him. And Oliveira went down, like pursuing a takedown. And I think that's where you really got to see, you know, you, throughout this entire round, you got to see Charles Oliveira just surviving really well. But I thought you really got to see it here because he goes down, miss, fails on the shot, is on his hands and knees, and Chandler's about to wail on him with punches. And the whole time he's moving his head, going to duck him for a shot, realises he's not going to get it, gets hit, sits back to guard. It was something that Frank Mir talked about a while ago. I think it was the second... Oh, no, it wasn't the Lesnar fight. It was one of the other ones. Oh, it was the second big Nog fight where he's getting beaten up. He was saying that he'd been working specifically on just moving because guys get so um, tied up on, like, trying to you know tie the other guy down or get a, a good position when you if you're hurt your main concern is the fight not getting stopped so you just got to keep moving and, and trying to make yourself a, a hard target while doing that second round they come out Chandler goes in for the right straight of the body comes out and gets left hooked on the way out and then gets uh, knocked down and finished both these guys known for sort of collapsing um, after getting hurt but I think Oliveira did an amazing job of showing that he's just you know even if he's still maybe a little chinnier than a lot of the best fighters in that division, um, he's certainly not a quitter, which was impre- impressive. I don't want to accuse uh, Chandler of quitting either. He just like he clearly is not as good at surviving and looking after himself when he's um, when he's hurt as Charles Oliveira is. You know, he just sort of tried to turn and and sprint out along the cage, and that's always been the case with Chandler. Like if he gets hurt, he has a hard time getting back into it. But I saw some astonishing takes on this. Like, you know, it's... Yes, Oliveira was hurt, came back, won it. But some people being like, lucky punch. And you're like, Michael Chandler loves the right straight to the body. If you watch this fight back, he's throwing the right straight to the body like five times for every time he throws a punch upstairs. It, it's his only other move. He doesn't have a whole lot of variety. He just has big power and speed. Charles Oliveira loves the left hook and likes to try and pull people in off it. The counter left hook specifically. Um... If you throw the right straight to the body naked and then you don't do anything except go straight back to get into your stance, you're open for... A, there's a huge opening there for that left hook, the counter left hook. Uh, that's why if you watch people who are good with their right straight to the body or, or good technical boxers with the right straight to the body, a lot of them will throw the right straight to the body, linger for a second and then weave out to their right because they expect the left hook to be coming back. You don't go in, change level, throw right straight to the body and then try and unchange level and reverse back out of it, which is what Chandler was doing on all of these. I mean, that was one of JDS's best setups. He'd throw the right straight to the body a load, and then you'd be trying to either hit him with the right uppercut or the left hook as he came in, and he'd just go in, like, level change towards your solar plexus, his nose towards your solar plexus, like he's going to throw a right straight to the body, and then he'd dip off to the left and throw the left uh, the overhand over the top. It's how he knocked out um, Cain Velasquez in their fight. It's how he knocked down Mark Hunt when Mark Hunt was just looking for check left hooks the entire fight. So no, not a lucky punch. It was just how those two guys' favourite punches matched up. A couple of things I really liked from um, Oliveira in this one. Using front kicks to the body a lot, coming in behind the high knee um, against a shorter opponent, always a great shout. But also like push kicking off the shoulder. Like, did you, If you saw that in the first round... He picks up his lead leg as uh, Chandler's coming into, I think it was a right hook, to the, uh, right straight to the body again. But as Chandler's coming in to throw a right hand, and he just push kicks him in the right shoulder. It was very cool. But um, yeah, amazing for Charles Oliveira. Not only did the UFC not want him to win, but he is like the, the perfect guy to win a UFC title. It's like when Michael Bisping won, you know. There is a lot to be said for guys who are, who just come in and are undefeated and, and go undefeated forever. You know, like they do get better. They, they No one comes in as a world champion. Habib Nurmagomedov didn't come in as a world champion. He got better from fight to fight. You know, Habib from the Gleason Tebow fight. <laughs> I love saying the Gleason Tebow fight. But Habib from his first fight in the UFC against, you know, the the Justin Gaethje that he beat or the Dustin Poirier that he beat, probably not going to have as much success. Um, you know, guys come in and they get better. But I think there's more, there's more to be enjoyed from people who aren't just like perfection incarnate going through you know the people who aren't the john joneses and the beebs i think it's more impressive to see someone have obvious faults and to work around it or improve or or, you know even if you can't get rid of those faults or or, or shore up the defense completely work in other areas to build your game out and and um, hide those weaknesses and charles Oliveira, until about 18 months ago well in fact 18 months ago people were saying 
this guy can't beat top opposition. He he came in against Kevin Lee, beat Kevin Lee, who is a very highly regarded guy, but again, has his own slips. Um, And people were like, yeah, but that's Kevin Lee. I don't think he ever really was top competition. Beats Tony Ferguson. And we all agree that Tony Ferguson has lost a step. But now it comes in against Michael Chandler. You know, height of his powers, wins. You know, got got through some adversity. But Charles Oliveira is on like an eight, nine, however many fight winning streak now. Yeah, nine. Um, I I think it was uh, my boy, Sadiq Yusuf, put up a, a... uh, picture which was Oliveira from 2012 to 2017 was like 10 and 8 and then from 2018 onwards he's uh, 9 and 0 you know it, it, it's an incredible story and granted some of those guys weren't like top flight opponents but he's always been someone that you've been able to see the potential in and um, I, th- I think another thing is that like coming to the UFC so young, because he came in as like the jungle fight champion or whatever, he, everyone was like, oh, phenomenal guy, he can he can strike and grapple, but it was just sort of like a, it, he was just sort of making it up as he went along and it was sort of a spazzy mess. Um, but coming in so young, people see you lose and where you might have got those losses outside of the UFC against lesser opposition, or, or you would have just been building yourself up against lesser opposition, uh, everyone can see you lose, and they just have this memory of you folding, and they go, well, he's a quitter, and he will always be a quitter. You know, it's, it's not like anyone can ever change. And, and I think that's the biggest thing about Charles Oliveira. He has changed, and grown, and improved. Now, if Habib came back tomorrow and they had that fight, I mean, you've obviously got to pick Habib because he's got that incredible record of um, un, un, uh, unbeaten excellence. But I think he's a hell of an interesting matchup. I mean, he, he's basically... Someone said he's what we thought Tony Ferguson was, and I don't think that's true. I think there's a lot of difference between the two fighters. But he brings that incredible bottom game, incredible ability to survive, to survive um, and uh, brilliant pressure stand-up. And also great wrestling in his own right. You know, attempted two takedowns on Chandler. One of them was stopped because he was basically out on his feet. But the first one, Chandler jumped the guillotine on, so we don't know if he would have stopped it. Um, and jumping a guillotine does count as a, a succeeded takedown in my book. But uh, jumping guillotine is the best way to lose a fight. If you are on the amateur scene or the low, like, professional level, don't ever jump a guillotine. Because if the guy's anywhere close to your level, you will lose the round based off that. But Michael Chandler, what's next for him? I mean, they could give him the rematch for all I know. Like, they love him. Um, but there's plenty of interesting matchups for him. I, I think the thing is with Michael, Chan- Michael Chandler is that he has this amazing talent and physical ability. But as I said, like, on the feet, not an awful lot of variety. Doesn't really set his shit up. Doesn't really build towards anything. Um, and, it, like, it's not like a... You know, where uh, Oliveira is is a, a, a cumulative performance where he's just he's getting off as much as possible because he wants to grind you down. Michael Chandler really is focused on the one big punch. However, there's some great fights out there for him. I'd like, I mean, him versus Gaethje, you got basically the two biggest bangers in the, in the division. Um, him versus the loser of Poirier McGregor. Lots to be going on with. And the, and the best part about this is that... Uh, Patricio Pitbull doesn't get to say that he'd be UFC champion. <laughs> he did spend his entire weekend calling out Charles Oliveira. And you're like, come to the UFC. Leave the B-Leagues. You know, if you're fighting... We all love Pitbull uh, because he makes Bellator cards good. But he's fighting Emmanuel Sanchez. You know, we'd rather see him fight UFC caliber featherweights or lightweights. I mean, he wouldn't last in the, in the uh, UFC lightweight division. He is too small. Which is crazy because he looked small against Chandler and Chandler looked tiny here and against Hooker. So um, I thought a decent performance out of Chandler too. And uh, some very interesting takes in the aftermath. People being be like, ah, it doesn't matter that Chandler didn't win. He'll be around for a while. They're like, isn't his thing literally saying I'm here for a good time, not a long time? But he was within grasping distance of being UFC champion. You know, we spent all that time laughing at him because he was just renegotiating contracts with Scott Coker. And then he actually did just come over and throw himself right into the middle of the division. Well, I mean, he got some he got some Dana White privilege, as Tony said the other the other week. That was just about the best line I've heard all year. You know, it's been a long time since someone made me laugh at a press conference. But I thought that was quite funny. Now, I suppose that brings us on to the, to the co-main event, which was kind of depressing. But it was sort of what we knew would happen. You know, um, I couldn't believe... The amount of people betting money on Tony Ferguson. My two bets this weekend... Oh, no, I had a third one, which was like a parlay on some of the undercard names, but it didn't go through. Can't remember what happened with that one, but I didn't win it. Um, my other ones were Lock of the Week actually failed this week for, the, I think, the first time or the second time. I bet uh, 
Shevchenko versus Lee to go to the decision and uh, Chikagian versus Araujo to go to the decision. Chikagian obviously went to the decision, but Antonina Shevchenko is even worse than we imagined she was. Managed to get submitted by um, Andre- uh, Angela Lee. And- Angela Lee? Andrea Lee. Whichever one's not in one. But then my other bet this week was a, a, I threw down a quick triple on Dariush, Chikagian and Barboza. And I thought they were all favourites, but I was hearing that uh, Barboza was actually the underdog by the time that betting closed um, ahead of this fight. But those just seem quite likely ones to me because, ben, you know, Tony has lost such a step and Darius is bringing similar grappling accolades and, and um, striking ability to Charles Oliveira. Barboza versus Burgos, I figured the Burgos would just hang around too long and get kicked up. Um, and I wouldn't actually get inside and pressure him properly. Uh, and Caitlin Chikagin, I just knew she'd win because the, like, she's better than most people in that division in the most boring of ways. So that t- that came out at like f- six to one, five point something to one. It was incredible. I, I bet five pounds on it at one thirty. So I was in an amazing mood all of Sunday, but uh, a little bit bummed out for my boy Shane Burgos and for Tony. So Tony versus Darius. Yeah, I mean, basically, someone put up a clip of um, Barbosa versus Ferguson and pointed out just how fucking fast they were like the the clip looks like they're in uh, they're sped up but you know the clock's there and they're clearly not um and then when you look back at like the fight with Cerrone and even the fight with Pettis it's just like Tony has slowed down significantly and you saw that in this one against Darius where he's like trying to step across himself and do funky stuff and Darius is just like nah mate and like grabs him and he saw it with his like uh, takedown defense too. Like he sprawls on Darius and just gets pushed into the fence. Um, was a bird holding a worm on my window? That's cool. Uh, anyway, yeah, the uh, striking t- Tony did better than the last time, but the grappling again was just him being completely smothered. Um, DC was on about him trying to like hold the half guard or whatever, but I thought he was doing a good job of trying to get butterfly hooks in and make stuff happen. Um, but Darius, I mean, he's a smothering top player. You just watched him win a fight on top of Diego Ferreira, who's probably more dangerous off his back than Tony a lot of the time. Man's unbelievably tough, though, because he did at one point create space to come up. And uh, Darius, like, sat to the bottom position, elevated him, got the saddle, and uh, started attacking an inside heel hook. And that is, you know, the whole reason the inside heel hook has done so well in grappling or, or you know, revolutionized grappling when the Danaher Death Squad. Um, started using it so uh, successfully is that it's a very very dangerous submission I mean it's the reason that Ryan Hall used the 50-50 back in the day and still does in MMA and it's the reason that Lachlan Giles uses the 50-50 the inside heel hook will fuck you up very very quickly and Tony just no sold it you look at him going yeah he's 37 he's looking old he's looking slower much slower um he seems to be in denial as to him slowing down and losing a step, but he is tough as nails because he just sat there and Dariush was trying to break his leg and it looked like he should have broken his leg and he couldn't break his leg. Or if he did, Tony just walked on it anyway. Um, so mad respect to him for that. But yeah, just couldn't get off the bottom. And if you you know if you can't do that, Habib match, no interest in that at this stage. You know, and I, I, I said it last time, but like Tony Ferguson has clearly taken more damage than Habib Nurmagomedov and his style was always about that and if you look back at like three or four years ago he was incredibly quick and dangerous and a much better fighter than he is now um and I think you know this I saw some really bad takes being like yes if he keeps fighting he'll ruin his legacy and you're like only with idiots you know <laughs> like with people who watched it at the time are like yeah okay he was really really good but I think every time that that Habib fight was booked it would have been a different fight you know it might have been different degrees of Tony losing but uh, you know I, I think treating like this Tony as every Tony you know in, in the sequence of five fights that were booked over like five six years um, would be um, daft but again it's all hypothetical so it doesn't really matter now we've all moved on it's gone long gone we can't have nice things because the time, the last time that they tried to book it, there was a fucking global pandemic and we still aren't out of it. I was going to say, let's talk about the other fights in the lightweight division, but they were at featherweight, which blew my mind. Edson Barbosa versus Shane Burgos at featherweight. I, I mean, I said this would be a good fight and it was a bloody good fight. Um, but yeah, I mean, Burgos lost for all the reasons I thought he would. Like we talked about this last week, but Michael Johnson 
showed how to beat Barboza just by running him ragged. And Benil Darius did the same thing against him, but ran onto a knee like after making Barboza look like trash for a round and a half or whatever it was. Um, but yeah, if you if you just pile in on Edson Barboza, you can make his life really hard. The pressure that Burgos brings is more like, I'm going to stand in front of you and we're going to agree that you're going to throw punches at my head and I'm going to try and slip them. It's not really pressure. It's more like, hey, um, do you mind if I just walk up and stand this close to you? over and over again if you keep Barboza on the back foot and out of his stance he has a really hard time he's very quick but everything comes out of that stance and as soon as you get him to leave it which he does to like skip around the ring he's not half the fighter and the way that Burgos fought him was like I'm going to walk up and meet you in your stance and we're going to trade blows from there and we're going to I mean there's a lot of things I think I think Shane Burgos is enormously talented but I think he fights in a really silly way a lot of the time Um, firstly he's the biggest man in the weight class and the tallest man in the weight class and he fights like he wants to get on the inside and slip inside punches you know you're like at that point just go up in weight he's already incredibly hard to take down he's draining himself enormously he's got a great chin at this weight class with all the water missing <laughs> so how good would he be you know, at taking punches if he went up to lightweight he'd probably be quicker there too um, and actually be able to avoid a lot more of them but i think Kicking has always been something I'd love to see more of from Shane Burgos and then use of the jab and then using slips to hit the body a couple of times in the, and then the head and then just leaving range. You know, I think that sort of body hitting, he should be doing stuff like, you know, like what Duran did. You know, you're fighting on the outside, you time your way in, hit the body twice, either hold and smother or or get out. You don't need to stand there and try and land like four or five um, counter you know slip and return flurries on the body because you're just making yourself really available to be hit and that's what's happened to Shane Burgos in like every fight he's had but when he kicked with Edson Barboza he was actually doing really well and this is the story of Barboza and basically anytime we're talking about a good kicker and I say yeah back him up and and kick with them so that you're making them pick their legs up the entire time people are like oh my god you can't kick with a kicker but yes you absolutely can it's not like left hook with a left hooker which is where you are literally getting into range to be left hooked and trading punches. If you're backing them up and kicking their legs, they're going to have to either check the kick or take the kick, and then they're not in position to kick back. You know, good kicking is about keeping the opponent out of position to do their kicking. If you kick him in the leg and you expect him to come back, you know, get out of the way or move in, press in on him, use your hands. You know, the the, the low kicks against people who are... If you know someone's going to throw low kicks um, and, and try and move and kick kick them so that they can't move as effectively or so that you know when they're coming back and you can time them. I'm trying to think of good examples of that. There have been a few where guys who are fighting a good kicker and they'll just kick them so that they kick back and then they they go through their prepared counters to deal with the kick. You know, if, if you've been working to counter something and then you can dictate when it happens, um, life gets a lot easier. But the front kicks were working really well for Burgos and I've always thought he has a lovely front kick. But the one thing I like about the front kick, well, there's a lot of things I like about the front kick, but one of the things I really like about it against Edson Barbosa is that it's physically pushing him out of his stance. Barbosa is the kind of guy you need to be physically pushing back all the time. You know, not just standing in front of going, please move away from me. I'm going to put you under pressure. But Barbosa was timing beautiful outside low kick every time Burgos uh, stepped into jab, using his standard left hook to the head and body to try and uh, score punches and pivot off. There were a couple of moments where Burgos backed him towards the fence and fainted to come in and Barboza went to leap for the knee. You know, that's like his answer when he's getting backed up. And, you know, why? What? who could blame him? He scored, he basically got out of jail for free against Benil Darius when he was losing that fight and then kneed him as he came in. I mean, Barboza, like, the stuff that you love about Barboza was all here. Wickedly fast, wickedly powerful. Working the body up and down. Wheel kicks as your man steps in. And he clipped him with a good right hand and, and Burgos was fine for a second and then his, his legs just gave out. Um, yeah, I mean, a weird one. You, you see him from time to time, just the way the body sometimes works. You know, like we don't have an awful lot of, we can't really study people getting head trauma, as I always say. You know, you can't you can't sign people up and then hit them in the head with a bat and, and measure their reactions and stuff. But um, yeah, I mean, you will sometimes see that in boxing, kickboxing, uh, the delayed response knockout. It's got to be scary, though, like, you know, in that moment where you've taken the punch and you go, OK, you know, he's going to come in on me now. He just hit me well. And then your vision starts narrowing or whatever. You know, I mean, it would be one thing to get knocked out by Edson Barboza. It'd be a, a scarier thing to know that, like, you're on your feet and you're not going to be able to defend yourself against Edson Barboza. 
I mean, that's the scariest thing about gassing out. You know, if, if there's one thing you don't want to be able to do, it's stand up but not defend yourself. Andre Munez versus um, Ronaldo Souza Jacare was incredible. Uh, fucking, it says inverted armbar here. It looked like a sort of a spirally armbar over the back. Uh, but yeah, he, he broke Jacare's arm, which is a weird full circle from when Jacare got his arm broken by Roger uh, Gracie and sort of ran down the clock because he was ahead on points. But kind of sad, you know, and it just like it goes to show one, this is an MMA fight, not a grappling match, as we saw with Rodolfo Vieira getting arm triangled the other was it arm triangled, getting submitted at any rate the other month. Um, but also, you know, we I think there's a tendency to treat because you've got like Damien Meyer out there still being Damien Meyer at the age of 40, 50, whatever he is. <laughs> um, I think there's this tendency to treat grappling like it is. You know, like it it doesn't age as badly as striking. You don't need your reactions and stuff as much. And it does. I mean, it's just a strength game. You can talk about technique all you want, but technique is like the the most effective application of strength. You know, it still matters. Uh, and the older you get, the more you're going to wane in those sort of um, physical attributes. Now, that's not to take away from Munez doing cool stuff. You know, I thought it was uh, really slick what he did going over because he, he tried to get on Jack Ray's back and then he went over the top and um, armbarred him. Um, but yeah, I mean, young, hungry fighter. Don't know how old he is, actually. Hold on, let me check. I'm going to look stupid if he's 38. No, he's 31. So young, hungry fighter against, uh, you know, elder statesmen in, M- in MMA, and that sort of stuff happens. Bit sad, though. Um, I saw some people saying that Jack- uh, that Musassi will now be safe calling for the Jackaray rematch. <laughs> uh uh, what else was good? Oh, Lando Venata versus Mike Grande. I, I had a lot of fun with this one. Scorecards were all over the fucking place. Someone gave it 30-27 for Grundy. And I, the only way you could do that is if you confuse their names. And I'm quite confident that's what's happened. Um, just amazing. Amazing that that can go completely... You know, that's like a doctor removing the wrong organ. You know, any other job, that level of being incompetent would get you fired immediately they'd be like no it's too dangerous <laughs> but in judging and you know i mean texas commission's a laughing stock anyway but in judging you can do whatever the fuck you want you can be obviously corrupt and the commission will come out and go no 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 it's just regular old incompetence we'll show them a video and then we'll try again <laughs> like fucking russell mora would you let that guy eat a thousand bod- uh, a thousand shots to the cup and then they were like well we're going to take him off the main event for a couple of weeks or Adelaide Bird, you know, there's so many of these guys. It's just the same five people over and over again fucking everything up. Probably for money, possibly not. They might just be incompetent, you know. If you're if you're if you're listing one of those people and you're offended by me saying you're possibly corrupt, uh, it's because you're bad at your job. So just stop. But the fight, at any rate, was great fun. Um, no low line sidekicks from Lando Venata, which was really strange because that's like his number one move. Um, but he was doing all sorts of interesting things like the switch 45. He was getting off onto, uh, Southpaw and doing stuff from there. I think everyone who, uh, well, in MMA, if you're going to strike, learn how to get onto the, uh, the opposite stance to your opponent and throw one or two, you know, learn how to sharpshoot from an open guard situation. Um, because, you know, if you, if you switch to, um, Southpaw against an orthodox opponent, firstly, you're feeding them the single right away you're taking away the double leg well certainly you're taking away a lot of their double leg uh chances um but secondly you're giving yourself that nice rear kick to their open side you can just punt their arm you can kick them in the body you know you can try and you could throw nice uh, front kicks to the body you can throw high kicks you know you've got a good chance of getting away with any hard kick you throw on that side particularly above the waist plus you've got the left straight set up where your jab would have been um and that's obviously a bit stiffer and that's what Venata did through this fight. He changed to Southport at a lot of points just to score good um, single shots. Also scored a nice um, counter right hook from Southport. Um, but really what was what stood out in this fight was just how good his wrestling was looking. Because Grundy, you know, gr- wrestling is all he does. And uh, Venata would kick him, get taken down off it, and immediately turn to his hands and, and tripod up or quad pod up, whatever you want to call it, get up to his feet. Um, and he was doing a really good job of uh, sealing out with his elbows. So he'd get one elbow like inside the body lock and, and uh, create some space that way but he was also really good at peeling the hands off basically any time he got taken down he'd turn his back peel the hands off and get uh, and, and turn back into him and Grundy basically lost this fight because he didn't have any backup options you know it's like with the other day when we we're saying those lasses 
going in for upper body clinches on people like Loma Lukbunmi and um, whoever that last was who lost by upkick, no, won by DQ because of upkick, um, who was judo throwing random markers on her head. You know, like if they're doing that one thing so well in the upper body clinch, why not just go in on their legs? You know, like, whereas in this one, it was like, you're taking him down, he's turning his back, he's getting away from the back body lock. You know, you need to enter into like enter into higher clinches you know body locks and things like that you know, box your way in or kick him get him to grab you and, and come in on a clinch um but grundy was just entering on the legs over and over again you know he was often catching one leg so Venata had all that time to turn to his uh his his hands and knees and i think if you're a wrestler too like you know there's one thing to only have the overhand out in the open and not be able to box in um but throw some fucking kicks there's no downside to you throwing kicks. If the guy tries to, to take you down and you know you're a really good wrestler, you know, you could start turning that into your offense. But more than that, like you need to be able to manufacture ways where you can hold the guy and hit him, you know, to, to be able to like push him against the fence and hit him with knees, to get the collar tie and start hitting him with uppercuts. The collar tie uppercut should be every wrestler's number one move, you know. Uh, I always think of Dustin Poirier, who, again, not a wrestler, but... Um, and I'm working on that advanced strike in Dustin Poirier this week, which is why I'm thinking of it. But against Joe Duffy, he looked like trash on the feet. Joe Duffy made him look a fool. So instead of like shifting in with punches, what he ended up doing was shifting in, getting hit in the face, but then grabbing a hold of a collar tie behind the head and you, and pumping off like four or five uppercuts while Duffy couldn't move. You know, if, if the guy, if the guy's beating you on footwork and head movement, grab his head. <laughs> um, yeah, it was just, Grundy's lack of variety, lack of having anything except a big overhand um, that lost him this fight. You know, as, as much as it's incredible that uh, Venata like shook off every takedown attempt and was able to stand up, there was no other threat going on. But yes, honestly, the most impressed I've been with Lando Venata, maybe ever. It was a very technical, savvy, smart performance um, where normally he's more of a madman. So what's left? Oh, Antonina versus uh, Andrea Lee. No. Priscilla Cachuera, oh god, this fight, this fucking fight. Gina Vazani takes Priscilla Cachuera down over and over again with almost no resistance. Priscilla Cachuera gets stood up from the guard and Gina Mazzani is now too tired to take her down again and too tired to strike. And this is the thing about Cachuera. If you watch her striking, she gets blasted in the face numerous times while coming in because she loads up her right hand behind her and then swings it from the side. Um... And it's because women, like, it's because she's fighting girls with no power. You know, she couldn't load up against um, Shevchenko because Shevchenko blasted her in the face. Not a huge hitter, but at least decent pop. Um, you know, if you're if you're a lass who's fighting Priscilla Cachuera and you can't hit, just focus on throwing high kicks because you will hit her and knock her out or she'll keep her hand at home. Like, those are the two options. But as it was, Cachuera won by knockout. Well, standing TKO. The, the most Because I, I saw this result KO and I was like... <gasps> Did she do it again, the bus driver uppercut? But no, this was the most flaccid TKO I've ever seen. It was like Mazzani was like, oh, I can't defend myself. And the ref just stepped in. Um, bit sad, but, you know, yeah. Oh, and then the other good one was Christos, uh, Christoph Yagos. Christos? Yeah, Christos Yagos versus uh, Sean Sariano. Great fight. Yagos was doing the wrestling. Sariano was doing the striking. You saw that... Um, I, I think he's a hoofed guy, but it's the hoofed sort of strategy of unbalancing with the low kick first. It's interesting because, you know, like the, the famous Dutch school or the, the idea of Dutch kickboxing um, or the thing that, you know, set it apart was the abundance of uh, punching combinations into low kicks from that closer range. Whereas modern MMA, the sort of meta is being ruled by guys throwing long, low, low kicks you know, below the knee. And uh, coming in, you know, getting their foot back to the ground before the opponent can get back in their stance and pushing in with like a one, two or a one, two, three or whatever um, afterwards, punching combinations off low, low kicks to unbalance. And you can do you know similar sort of thing by kicking the arm or whatever on the open side. But um, yeah, interesting. And he, and he was doing well with it, Soriano. But Yagos, he'd been doing he'd been doing like a high crotch to, to double leg in the first round. And then the second round, he comes in for a takedown ends up on bottom and rolls through it was incredible uh, and i don't think the commentators even talked about how incredible it was that he did it um but then he did some really interesting stuff from top he was holding side control with his hand between the other guy's legs like you know hooking the leg for a pin in pro wrestling I mean, we talked about how a couple of guys have been gravitating towards that uh, more recently it's, it's kind of like an old school catch wrestling ride um but he did that and the guy dug the underhook and yagos 
used his his other hand to push his head down so that he came up on the uh, front headlock and he very quickly switched off to the dart. It was it was lovely. Uh, it looked like he he was trying to bait him into coming up to his knees and slowing him down as he did. But the dart was so slick. Like he turned him through and immediately hooked the leg. You know that's part. If you if you watch most people get in the dart, they get they lock up the dart. They just sit to their back or whatever. Um, you know they get into that position where they're supine rather than um you know on their hands and knees and then they're walking around like homer simpson on the floor trying to catch the guy's leg as he runs away uh and uh, no he got it immediately and put him to sleep so i thought that was a really good fight if uh edson barboza versus shane burgos hadn't already won the uh fight of the night maybe i'd give it to that oh but they gave yagos the the performance of the night anyway that's good and then my favorite moment of the night to cap off the entire event as Dana White begrudgingly puts the belt around the waist of Charles Oliveira, who is so grateful, by the way, he like ran out to, to talk to Dana White and be like, thank you for giving me the opportunity, you know, all those years ago or whatever. Um, and Dana White just looked sad the entire time that Michael Chandler hadn't won. But when uh, Dana threw the belt around Charles Oliveira's waist, the buckle, which looks like it weighs a good pound or two, slapped Dan Mergliata right in the cock. It was, it was absolutely fantastic. Go back and watch that. Uh, anyway, I reckon that'll do us for today. We'll do some questions later in the week because the card is so mediocre this weekend. Um, yeah, a fun night of fights. Just, you know, still sort of buzzing that Charles Oliveira was able to reinvent himself like that and successfully complete that arc, you know. I don't know how long he'll stay champion because he is, you know, he'll, he does get hit, he does get hurt. Um but certainly answered a lot of questions. Until he loses, and then people will say he's a quitter anyway. So <laughs> you, you can't fucking win. Unless he retires right now, like Habib. Anyway, if you want to get in on the uh, Patreon stuff, get in on the extra shit we do, read um, my ultra nerdy piece from last week, the Advanced Striking 2.0 Tommy Lochran, and whatever we decide to do this week, uh, sign up to the Patreon, support the podcast. If you want to see what I'm writing at any time, fightprimer.com. And if you want to send an email to the podcast, jackslackpodcast at gmail.com. I am your boy, Jack Slack, being seconds away from having to admit that Michael Chandler is the worst matchup for Habib. Bless.